Well, Tom was racking his brain. He was pulling his hair out. He hadn't been in the situation before. The words just weren't coming. He couldn't think of the last time that he had so much trouble just figuring out how to put words together. The fact is, a good chunk of his sterling reputation was because he was a writer, and a good one. But this was different. This meant everything. Every word would be scrutinized. And his colleague, John, had begged him to do it. He said that no one else could. And so Tom went away into seclusion and just started to write, trying to figure out what to say for a situation like this. And then it hit him. He knew exactly the word he wanted. And it would be the cornerstone of this composition. It would relay the right tone and precisely define what this whole thing was all about. The problem was, at least for a writer, he didn't know what the right prefix to the word was. Was it in or un? He honestly didn't know. So he used both in separate drafts. When John read it, he said, it's un. So that's what was included in the final copy that they turned in to the committee for review. And the committee liked that word and that document so much, they decided they were willing to die for it. The word was unalienable. The document was the Declaration of Independence. The committee was the Continental Congress. And Tom, Thomas Jefferson, and John, John Adams, had done the lion's share of the work putting together the document of the Declaration of Independence. Interesting note about Tom and John, they both died on the same day. Exactly 50 years to the day that everyone signed that document. July 4th, 1826, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died. Unalienable is not an everyday word. Would you agree with that? In fact, when we hear unalienable, do we always think of the only time we ever hear that word, the document, the Declaration of Independence? Is that true? But its meaning is very clear if you look it up. It means can't be taken away, can't be reduced, can't be transferred. The only thing not clear about the word unalienable is the prefix. A lot of times you hear presidents say inalienable or unalienable, and you go, well, the fact is both are correct and both are used. In the Declaration, it says unalienable. If you go to the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., and look what's etched on stone, what's etched on stone is inalienable, even though he wrote unalienable. Either way, Jefferson knew we had rights that couldn't be taken. And the reason they couldn't be taken away is because they're not given to us by a government. They're not given to us by a king. They're given to us by, by God, our creator. They were rights given by God, given to every human being. And so he wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a clumsy word, but a great word, unalienable. It expresses a concept that is the cornerstone of our nation, that of individual freedom given by God. These rights, these freedoms, are inseparable from us. They are part of our humanity. They can't be taken away. You see, words matter. They're important. They convey concepts and principles about the core of who we are or what we stand for, which is why we're doing a summer series called The Seven Words That Can Change Your Life, because words matter. They're important. They communicate the core of who we are. They allow us to communicate to other people the core. And we're going to look at seven words that give you the unalienable freedom to be the person that God created you to be. The person, really, that you've always wanted to be, but you didn't know how. 
And this subject is a subject that many pastors have talked about. Among them are J.D. Greer and John Ortberg and Ray Johnston and Larry Osborne, and we're putting compass stamp on it. We're looking at one word every week that can drastically unclutter your life so that you can make space for God. Amen? That's what we're trying to do. And the first word we talked about last week Is the word? Very good. How many people said that a lot this week? Yeah, a few of you. Good. You tried it out. See how it was? No is one of the most liberating words in the English language. Do you not agree? It's very liberating. No. No. Not going to do that. Because many of us find our lives crammed full of stuff we've said yes to. And we learned last week, you know what? That creates no breathing room because we mistakenly fall into the lie that says our identity comes from what we have. So we spend a lot of time trying to get more. Or identity comes from what we do, so we try to perform and do more. Or identity comes from how people approve of us, so we try to please more. And we cram and we cram and we cram and our life becomes crammed with a whole bunch of stuff. And it's just more and more and more. It's exhausting. It's exhausting because we find it hard to say no. There's just so much pressure to conform to the activities that our schools plan or that our work demands or that our culture encourages. And the Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Romans, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by God. In other words, make room for God. Make space for God. And that starts by saying no. No. So we're going to practice saying no one last time before we move on to our second word. Because we need to start saying no more often to this culture and to Satan's lies. And truthfully, it's best to say no with a little attitude. (laughs) It really is. That's the only way to say no right. You know, it's like... Hey, world, you're nuts. I'm not going to do that. No. No. No way. No. So let's practice saying no to specific things. The world says, buy things you don't need and get more. But we're going to say, with attitude. The world says, live an insanely scheduled life. Do more and more. But we're going to say, no. No way. The world says, impress people you don't even like. Just spend your time pleasing more. But we're going to say, no, 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 we're not going to say, yeah. Not yes to that. We're going to say no. No is the first of the seven words that can change your life. And the reason why I wanted to start with no, because it kind of sets up the other words. When you say no, then you have a chance to say these other words. And our second word is, pretty easy. Our second word is? Yes. Yes. See, you just say that so much better. You do. Say that so much better. It's great. Yes. Yes is a great word. Do you know we were made for yes? We were made for yes. We love saying it. It brings a smile on our face just to say it. Yes. Yes. No is important. But you can't live on a diet of no. That's a horrible life, isn't it? It's all you say is no. You got to say yes. But no is the appetizer that frees up, frees us up to live a life of yes that we were meant to live. A dentist told me one time that uh, most people brush after a meal, but he said, you know what, you really want to get the flavor of the meal? Don't use toothpaste, but take a brush and brush before the meal. If you brush before the meal, the flavor, you'll get more. It'll prepare the gums and the teeth to really, just really to take in the flavor of the meal. I have no idea if that's true or not, but I remember him telling me that. I'm not even sure if I've ever tried it. But I like the example because it reminds me of what no is. No is like that brushing before the meal. We should have a meal, a full flavor of life is yes. But you can't get there until you brush with no. 
and take all those things that you don't need out of your life so that you're able to say yes to the important things. Amen? That's what it's like. Yesterday I officiated the wedding of uh, Ryan Dillon and Kaylin Hopper, two wonderful people from Compass. It was great. It was my first fly-by wedding. What I mean by that is Ryan's a pilot, and he had a friend of his. The wedding was outside, fly over right during the wedding. Very cool, and drop things on us. I don't know if they're good things, but they were dropping on us. As we sat there, it was pretty cool. But guess what? In a wedding, the most important word in the entire wedding is... Yes! That's the most important word of the wedding. Have you been to a wedding where they said no? It's not a fun wedding. <laughs> it's not. The most important word is yes. It's not a, really much of a wedding unless their answer to do you take this is yes. Yes. If you think about it, everyone carries in their heart a yes and a no for every other person they meet. It's true. Every encounter, every relationship, you carry in your heart a yes or a no for people. Not just romantically, but in friendship, companionship. When there's someone who has a yes in their heart for you, it changes the whole dynamic of that relationship. Am I right about, right about that? It just changes everything. When they have a yes in their heart for you, you go closer to them. You want to be around them. People with a yes in their heart for you love to encourage you. They want the best for you. They want to watch you soar. They're looking out for you. They believe in you. They'll even confront you sometimes. They'll challenge you sometimes. But it's all with a yes in their heart because they want the best for you. On the other hand, you know what it's like to have somebody who has a no in their life for you. We all do. We've all been in those conversations, and it's hard to be around them. It seems like they're out to wound us, and they can't, they can't wait to find something to criticize us with. Now, granted, that's easy when you're looking at me. i got a lot to choose from when it comes to criticizing, but it's still no fun. It's no fun, and they take advantage of it. It's like, a, it's like they spend their time forming a cloud in their hands so they can rain on your parade, whatever that is, and you see them coming. And these yeses and these noes that we carry in our heart, they communicate. We communicate to them, to other people all the time. That's what we do, whether we intend to or not, in subtle ways and not so subtle ways. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been at a party where you're talking to somebody and they are looking past you saying, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh? How does that feel? They got a no in their heart for you. They're looking out for somebody. Or, even better yet, and I've seen this, I love to watch nonverbal behavior. I've, I love to see conversations, you're just looking at somebody, times, and one of the people have their, their, their leg ready to go. They got like the drop step. <laughs> They're just waiting for the other person to finish their sentence so they can take off. You see that all the time. That's a no in the heart. Happens all the time, you see it. Watch people in a room. But I can't wait to attach myself, to put myself in the company of people with a yes in their heart for me. How about you? It's wonderful. It's why I love going to India. There is no other reason to go to India, let me tell you. I've been there five times. It is a very hard country. It's hard to breathe there. It's hard to do anything there. But the people there have a yes. Look at these kids. Look at their faces. They have a yes in their heart. When we come, the only one that doesn't is right in the middle of the picture. You see this girl? <laughs> she obviously has a no. But everybody else, it's like big smiles. I can't wait to high five you. I can't wait to hug you. And this is what we get every time we're there. And you see these kids, there's a bunch of kids that you get to go with, and they've got a yes in their heart. And they're living in dire circumstances. And you're going there, you go, man, it's hot here. And you sleep on the dirt while you're there. It's a hard life. I won't even go into the, the bathrooms or non-bathrooms that they have or how you take a shower. It is a hard trip. I'm here to sell the India admission trip next year. It's a, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You got that right. 
It's hard. The reason we do it, the reason we go back, guess what? The reason we fill up every time we go, we've never had a problem filling it up, because these kids have yes in their hearts for us. They have yes in their hearts. They love when we come. It's great. I got this one guy, Vishal. Here's a picture of me and Vishal. I'm still communicating to him today. Met him when he was 11 years old. He's 20 now. Communicate with him all the time on Facebook. He knows pretty good English. And I'm Facebook friends with, I think, I want to say, about 90 kids <laughs> over there. And Vishal is one of them that I just love. And he can't wait to talk to me and talk to me about his life and what he's doing. He's doing great. He's doing great. Coming from an orphan to getting a great job and going through school and graduating and going through university, graduating. It's a wonderful kid. A wonderful kid. That's what a yes looks like. And relationships like that can't be beat. Which is why your answer to the next question is so important. Do you think God has a yes or a no in his heart for you? Now, I don't want you to answer that quickly or flippantly just because you're in church and, of course, God loves you. I want you to think about your actions because they tell me where your heart is. Do you act like God has a yes or a no in his heart for you? Do you live like that? Do you live like God wants to see you soar, that he's rooting for you, like he wants the best for you? Is the picture of God that you carry around in your mind one of him smiling at you? Or one of him finger wagging, frowning, showing disappointment? Think about that. Because it's not an easy answer. Should be, but it's not. It's not. We're in church, we always give the flippant answer. We always go, oh, of course God's for me. But do you live that way? Do you act that way? Zephaniah 3.17 says this, The Lord your God is in your midst. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. In other words, you're so humbled by how much he loves you. He quiets you. He will exalt you over you with loud singing. He wants you to know. He wants you to hear how much he loves you. Romans 8, great passage many of us know. Paul says, I'm sure this, neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that? Do you act like that? Is that the way you go through life? Do you believe that God has a big yes in his heart for you? And if you lived like God had a yes in your heart, his heart for you, the regret, the guilt, the shame, the worries, the fear that we often carry like, like some giant weight around our neck, That'd be going. That'd be going. The legendary uh, college basketball coach Bobby Knight did something that, it, it's just a great example of this. Years ago when he was coaching at Indiana University, he had a, a big star, a guy named Huey Blobby, went on to play, uh, uh, I think he was from Sweden or something, or maybe Germany, I have no idea, but he went on to play pro, great. He was like 7'2", seven, 7'3", seven, big guy. He, uh, every player for uh, Bobby Knight, had an ideal weight that you had, that was your playing weight. And he uh, spent the summer eating all that kind of stuff, and he came into camp, came into uh, school 10 pounds overweight. And he told Coach Knight, he said, 10 pounds, that's nothing, I'm 7'3", what's 10 pounds on 7'3"? And Bobby says, you're right, it's probably nothing. So let's have everybody play 10 pounds overweight. So what he did was he got a lanyard and he put a 10-pound barbell on every single other player on the team. And he made them practice with the 10-pound weight until Yui Blob lost the 10 pounds. Yui Blob didn't have to wear one. His teammates did and practice and run sprints with 10 pounds of weight on them. Coach Knight was trying to teach him a lesson, and Yui Blob lost that weight really quickly, I got to tell you. Teaching him a lesson, 10 pounds does matter. 
I tell you that story because we often say the same thing as Huey Blot. We always say, you know what, 10 pounds of guilt, 10 pounds of regret, 10 pounds of shame, it won't affect my relationships. But it will. But it will. And we carry this around, knowing that God is up there smiling. He's rooting for you. What's the best for you? Yet we, we mire ourselves down with this shame and this guilt. Instead of just giving it to God and saying, Lord, I know you forgive me. I know I did things wrong, but I know you forgive me. Coming to him openly, honestly, and saying, help me not to do that the next time. I'm giving you this guilt. I don't want to carry it around. Because God doesn't want you carrying it around either. You can't live that way. It affects everything. Let me say that again. It affects everything. Every relationship you have, it affects you. It affects our relationship with God, and it affects our relationship with others. And the Bible is so clear how our relationship with God, this vertical relationship, affects our horizontal relationships with each other. It talks about it all the time. When the vertical is out of whack, your relationships with each other will be out of whack. When your vertical is misaligned, your relationships with others will be misaligned. When your marriage is out of whack, the first thing you should look at is your relationship with God. Because as you align your relationship with God, this is what I talked about yesterday in the wedding, as you look to God and align that relationship, the more and more aligned you'll become as a couple. Every single time. That's how to get your relationship with each other right, is getting yourself aligned with God. It's the best way. The Bible talks about that all the time. When we're not sure that God's yes is for us, then our yes for other people suffers greatly. And our relationships suffer greatly. The Bible puts it simply like this. In 1 John 4.19, he says, We love because he first loved us. In other words, we can't love like we need to love until we get this right. And because God got this right, we can love others. There's a great example of this with the Apostle Paul. He's in a relationship with a church in the city of Corinth. And they're not quite sure if Paul has a yes in his heart for them. They're really not sure at all. He had written them a pretty stinging letter. If you ever read 1 Corinthians in the Bible, boy, you come away and go, man, that's, that's painful. That's painful to read. Paul hits them pretty hard. Not that they didn't deserve it, but he hits them pretty hard in 1 Corinthians. And then he tells them about his plans to go visit them. But then suddenly he had to change those plans. And they're left wondering, is Paul a yes in his heart for us or a no? Is he rooting for us? Does he want us to succeed? Or does he want this whole Corinth church experiment to go away and not bother him because we've screwed it up so much? And in Paul's second letter to the Corinth church, He lays this whole concept that our yes to others is completely tied to God's yes to us. He basically says to all of us, you want great relationships? Then ground them in the character and the heart of God. He says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, you may be asking why I changed my plan. Do you think I make plans carelessly? Do you think I am like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. In other words, there's a yes in my heart for you. Verse 19, for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas and Timothy and I preach to you and is God's ultimate yes. He always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. There's a lot of yeses in there. Am I right? Lots of yeses. This is a great passage, so let me unpack it. The first yes is that God is faithful, that Jesus doesn't waver, that God has a yes in his heart for each of us. That's the first yes. In fact, he says, every promise that God has ever made was and will be fulfilled in Christ with a yes. That's what Paul says. I want you to think about that. How many promises has God made? 
The answer, an awful lot. In fact, some theologian, I don't know how, read the whole Bible and started counting them. And by his count, God made 7,457 promises in the Bible to us. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know it's a lot. 7,457. And Paul doesn't say, you know what, a lot of them are yes. He, he, he doesn't say, you know what, many of them will come true. He, he doesn't even say, most of them you can count on. He says, every single one of them in Christ Jesus is yes. Yes. And what does that mean? Well, it means while your mother may have said no, or your father may have said no, or your kids right now are saying no, or that company you applied for said no, or the boss you have now may be saying no, or your coach is saying no, or the IRS is saying no, or that girl or that guy may have said no, and there'll be all kinds of no's in your life, they're not from God. They're not from God. All of God's promises, 7,457 by the last count, are yes in Christ Jesus. God has a yes in his heart for you. He's not distracted when he's talking to you. He's not looking over your shoulder going, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. He doesn't have his foot ready to go when you pray. Can't wait till Drew finishes this prayer. I gotta get out of here. He has a yes in his heart for each of us. What does that mean? God, will you save me? The answer is yes. God, will you forgive me? The answer is yes. God, will you give me a new start? The answer is a little louder. Yes. Yes. God, will you give me strength? The answer is God, will you give me guidance? The answer is yes. God, will you give me wisdom because I really don't know what I'm doing? The answer is yes. yes. God, will you give me the ability to forgive this person and to triumph over my bitterness? The answer is yeah, he will. God, will will you be with me every day of my life? The answer is yes. yes. God, after I die, will you put me in a place of incomparable joy and unimaginable productivity and teamwork and incomprehensible leadership and purpose? The answer is a big yes. yes. His promises are all yes in Christ Jesus, which tells you why we focus on Jesus around here. Because Jesus is God coming to show us, yes, yes, God keeps his promises. That's what Jesus is all about. And that's why the yes you and I are are invited to live in, we can live in that every day. Every day. And because of that first yes from God to us, it paves the way for the second yes from us to others and back to God. That's the power that we have, only from God. Because God said yes to us, we can now say yes back to him and yes to others. It's what it's about. Paul says that because God is faithful with his yes, our yes to you, the Corinthian church, he says, will never waver. Because God said yes. He even introduces a second word for yes here. The first word he uses was a Greek word. The word nigh means yes in Greek. But for our yes to others and back to God, he uses the Hebrew word for yes, which is amen. Amen. Now, unfortunately, in our day, amen has taken on a whole new deal. You know, it's become a churchy word or a pious word or a word that only people in the front row in church use or only people from the south, like Skip and Sherry. Where is Skip and Sherry? There you go. It's only them use, you know. It's only people like that use. People, in other words, people who are different, they use them. But that's not the way it was in Paul's day. The word amen was a fabulous word. They lo- Israel loved the word amen. It was yes on steroids. That's what amen was. It didn't just signal someone's placid agreement or approval for something. 
It was a resounding affirmation for whatever you said or did. Amen. Say it with me. Amen. They said yes, and they said it all the time. And you could translate it, yes, that's right. That's right. Let it be. You could translate it, woo <laughs> Say that with me. woo That's how you can translate it. Rabbis used to teach that any time you heard about something that God did or any time you saw one of God's promises lay out in somebody's life, they taught that the Torah mandated that we give a resounding amen, whether or not you were in church. When you saw it, you'd say, amen, say amen. amen. That's what rabbis taught all the time. Today, especially in American churches, it's like one of those high-class auctions that you go to, right? You ever been to one of those or seen them on TV? Where everybody just goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you in the back. That's how we are in church now, isn't it? Unless you go to the south, that's how we are in church. We're a high-class auction. In Israel, that wasn't the case. They love the word amen. Anytime somebody said something like, man, God loves us, everybody would say, amen. 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 They didn't want anybody to be unclear about that. Yeah, I agree with that. Amen. Amen. Today we just kind of raise our eyebrow, raise our hand. Yeah. Thanks, Pastor Drew. I agree with that. Like your support. Thank you. You see, we are a conduit of God's yes to other people. Did you know that? We're a conduit of God's yes. God fulfills his promises not just through Jesus. The Bible tells us through us too, through people who love him. We're that conduit of God's love, of God's yes, of God's goodness. And we're a conduit of it all the time or not. We can choose not to be. But we can be all the time. It's a strange thing about human relationships. Every time you're with somebody, you're either, you're either giving them a little yes or a little no. There's never a neutral relationship in life. Never. And you know that. I don't need to tell you that. There's never neutral relationships. You're either giving somebody a little yes with your actions and your words or a little no by what you're doing. There's no such thing as a neutral encounter. There's no such thing as an encounter you have with somebody else in which God isn't interested. God's interested in every encounter you have with everybody. So the question is this. How do we make our lives a yes for God and for other people? How do we be, all, constantly be that conduit? Well, the Bible describes a number of yeses, and I can't possibly cover them all in one message. So I just wanted to start with some very simple ones. Real easy ones. And then let you take it from there as God leads you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you after this. So, man, we'll just, we'll just take some real simple ones. And the first yet I, yes I want to highlight is how we approach our encounters with other people. We can either build up or tear down. Say that with me. We, we can either build up or tear down. Simple as that. In every encounter that you have with anybody, you're either building up or tearing down. Every one with your words, with your face, with your body language, whatever. All the time, every conversation. We can't help it. It's part of the human experience. It's part of the human expression. And God says, take the opportunity to say yes. Take the opportunity to say yes. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, encourage one another and build each other up. As you know, I spent a month in uh, England and Croatia and all these, uh, all these places, but a lot of those places we're going nuts because the World Cup was on. And we're in England when England's playing, and we're in Croatia when Croatia's playing, and they're both doing really good, and it is amazing. And everywhere you go, the enthusiasm they have for the World Cup triples whatever you think is the greatest enthusiasm here. If you think of SEC Southern football fans as being rabid, they're nothing compared to the fans of the World Cup over there. Nothing. I was telling somebody this the other day. 
uh, during the time we were over there, Oregon State baseball team was playing in the World Series. We went into a pub that had like 27 TVs. Every single one of them was on the World Cup. It was like 1 in the morning because that's, that's what time Oregon State was playing. And I went up to the bartender and just quietly asked, can you change just one TV to Oregon State baseball? What do you think the answer was? It's over there. No. No. He looked at me like I was crazy. I was just like, like, what? Are you kidding me? It's the way it is. But one thing, they did make a couple TVs while I was over there. They started Wimbledon, too. So we went into a pub during lunchtime, you know, if 25 of them were on the World Cup and two of them were on Wimbledon because we were in England. So they, you know, it's kind of interesting. So I was watching soccer matches and I was watching at the time we were eating lunch, they were playing some doubles matches in Wimbledon. And and it really, it was interesting because it got me focused specifically on the doubles match. Soccer matches were doing the same kind of thing. It was a team of people that were doing together. Now, these are the greatest athletes you can possibly imagine. These are the highest people at their level, you know. Whether you're playing in Wimbledon or you're playing uh, during the World Cup, this, you're the best of the best at what you're doing. And it's interesting to me how the best of the best act when they're on a team. Talk about building one another up and encouraging one another. It was amazing. In the doubles match I watched during the lunchtime, it was funny. One guy on this one team, his serve stunk. I mean, he couldn't hit his serve for his life. He was constantly on the second serve, and if you play tennis at all, if you're constantly on your second serve, you're going to lose that match. His partner had nothing but encouraging body language, encouraging words. It was always, yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy was just, and he was getting killed at the net. I mean, it was always the second serve, and his partner sitting there, bam, you know. That guy would take the second serve and just kill him. But it was nothing, man. It was always encouraging, always coming back. Big smile on his face. We're going to get this. We're going to get this. Really interesting. I got to sit there and watch, because I, I came in at the end of the match. I got to watch it. This guy was doing terrible until the final thing. This was a tie match, and it went to a tiebreaker in doubles. And guess who was serving out the match? This guy that couldn't get a first serve for his life. And what did he do with the tiebreaker? After being encouraging by his, by his partner the whole time, he hit an ace. He hit an ace. Now, you can't tell me that that would have happened if the, his partner was down on him the entire match. Like, what are you doing? What do we practice for? You're killing me over here. Do we, I mean, do we come to win this match? If you had that attitude, if there was a no in his heart for this guy, there's no way in the world he would have served out the match that way. But it was nothing but positive things. He built him up the whole time. So when it mattered, he was able to come through. Who are the people in your life that need that encouraging word? Who are the people in life that you need to be building up? So when it matters most, they're going to make the right decision because they got somebody in their life building them up. Really important. Makes a difference. You could be the person in somebody's life that gets them over that hump just by building it up. Simple yes. Simple yes. Here's another simple yes in how we approach our encounters with other people. We can either acknowledge or dismiss. This is a simple one. We can either acknowledge or dismiss. In every encounter, you're either acknowledging somebody or dismissing somebody. Every one. Doesn't matter. With your words, with your face, with your body. Even if you don't know them. Every conversation, all the time. And God says again, take the opportunity to say yes. Romans 16, 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And we're going to practice this today. (laughs) Some of you are going like, I like this church. This is a great church. (laughs) Some of you are heading for the exits. But it's really interesting. Paul here in his letter to the Roman church doesn't say, pass on my greetings to the people in Rome. He says, I want you to greet each other. I want you to acknowledge each other. Be people who acknowledge each other. And the idea is this. You walk down a street. You walk down a hallway at work. You walk around this gym at church. And there are people that are hurting. And you might not even know them. Your first step is to acknowledge. Your first step is to acknowledge by your word, by a nod, by your face. Acknowledge that they're there. Acknowledge that they came into your space 
and you're, they're welcome in your space. A lot of times, we just put out an R that says, you're not welcome in my space. God says, give them a yes. Acknowledge that they're there. Greet each other with a holy kiss. Or you can say no and dismiss them and ignore them. Pretend that they're not there. Shut people out. We do that all the time. And it might sound like a real small thing, but it isn't. I, I read a book one time by a guy named Lyle Schaller. If you know him, he's a big-time church guy that has all, he's an older guy. It's just an amazing guy that writes a lot of book on, on church health, how to get a healthy church. <laughs> he, had a, he had this one whole chapter on the, the uh, seven greetings. And, and it, was the, uh, it was saying, if you get, he took a survey of a whole bunch of people, thousands of people. He said, if you get greeted seven times in a church, you have a 70% chance of staying at that church. Now, I have no idea if those statistics are true. I took statistics in college. You can make them say whatever you want. I don't care. That's not the point. The point is, when you acknowledge people, are they more likely to stay at your church? Yes. Thank you. Say that again. Yes. yes. That's the point. Yeah, absolutely. They are. He said, you want to get somebody there? It's not what the pastor says. It's not the good music. If they have seven people that come and say, glad you're here. That's all it took. It wasn't like some deep conversation. And he studied this and he studied this. Now, I don't know if the seven's right, but I do know it's true. I do know that people like to be acknowledged. I do know that people like to be greeted. It doesn't have to be a long conversation. What matters is that people are acknowledging each other. And it makes a difference in the decisions that they make when you acknowledge each other. And what you'll find, what I find is, it's kind of funny. I started doing this early on in, uh, in my work life. And I found that people take the same routes during the day. So I might not know somebody, but I see them. If I acknowledge them, I begin to see them on that same place at that same time. Do you have people like that in your life? Where you're going down someplace and you find, that's right, you're you're walking down. Every day at 12 o'clock, you're walking down here. It's just like I am. It's amazing. And you start relationships with these people for no other reason than you acknowledge them that first time and then you see them again. See them again. Say, how cool. And I have a couple friends that that's how our friendship started. Just because by acknowledgement, it's important. Last one, last yes. In our relationships, we can either yield or we can crush. We can yield or we can use ourselves to dominate that relationships. We live in a world where people push to get their own way, push for their own needs. But Paul says this, and this was as revolutionary back then as it is today. It's an amazing verse, Philippians 2, 3. In humility, value others above yourself. Think about that. In humility, value others above yourself. Not looking merely to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In every encounter we have with somebody else, it's an opportunity for us to say, you go first. You go first. If you've ever been on a plane, and I've been on many planes recently, if you've ever been on a plane, you notice a fairly common phenomenon. When the plane lands and is taxiing to the gate, everybody's in their seat leaning forward, ready to take their seatbelts off. So what? So they can get up into the aisle and beat the guy across the aisle so they can get out before him. So they can get to their car 10 seconds earlier. Am I right? Happens all the time. Something as simple as that. we got to be there. It's got to be us. Paul says, look out for the interests of others. Ask yourself, do I yield for people? Do I make a way for people? It's amazing how you make somebody's day when you just let them go. You know, somebody's got more uh, groceries in line, and you got two things, and you look back, whatever. Let them go before you, and they'll go, what? Now, you do that the other way around. If they have less and you have more, but... That doesn't surprise them. Well, you only have two things. Let them go. Let somebody go who has a basket full of junk, and you got one thing. They'll go, what? Would you come to my birthday party today? I like you. Serious. It's like, whoa. That's somebody. I tell my kids all the time, it's one of the, you know, dad's, Dad's sermons at home, you know, those kind of things. I, I tell people to always ask people to tell their story first. Don't start telling what you're about first. In any relationship you have, 
Get to know the other person first. Say, hey, well, you know, what's going on with you? Where do you live? What do you do? Ask them first. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. And don't wait around. And sometimes, you know, most of the time, they'll say, hey, what about you? Not all the time. And that's okay. Some people will never ask you about yourself. And you know they have a no in their heart <laughs> for you. That's okay. You forgive them. And maybe you'll get in another conversation with them sometime. Maybe when they realize that their way of doing life isn't working, they might come back to the one person that let them, let them tell their story first. And they might become friends with you. That's how it works. The yes of you go first. The yes of valuing uh, others above yourself. And it doesn't mean you don't value yourself. He never says don't value yourself. He doesn't say don't look out for your own interests. He says don't merely look out for your. Look out for the interests of others. There's lots of yeses that I can talk about that I can't today. I don't have enough time. There's the, the yes of serving versus feeding that's so prevalent in the church. People come and say, feed me. I want to be fed here. Instead, God's gifted me. How can I serve here? Two different ways to look at it. The yes is, how can I serve here? The no is, Drew, just feed me. Feed me. Won't go into that. It's another one. There's tons of them. The yes of giving instead of hoarding. God gave it to you. Are you a funnel or a cup? We talked about that. A funnel to other people? And God keeps filling you out, or a couple, a cup, and God fills you up and says, well, you're not, it's not going anywhere. I'm not going to, I'm going to take away my blessings now. I've already filled you up. Boom, done. Lots of stuff that we can do. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do his work in your heart. Just start with those simple ones, and then see what God has for you. Other areas that you can say yes to. Now, I know the Bible doesn't say this, but I'm pretty sure when Jesus walked out of the tomb, his first word was, Yes. Yes. Because it was another promise fulfilled. That was his first word. Yeah. Yeah. It's why I don't know if you've ever looked at the end of the Bible. Have you? Have you ever looked at the last verses of the Bible? It's great. A lot of people have never read the final words of the Bible, but they're glorious words. Glorious words. There's a reason why the Bible ends the way it does. The last two verses of the Bible are these. They're Revelation 22. He who testifies to these things, and it's saying... The verses was talking about Jesus, so it's saying that he who rose from the grave, who testified about those things, says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus will be with God's people. And it ends with amen. amen. The Bible ends with a yes. It ends with a yes. In fact, there's a whole bunch of yeses just in those verses. Jesus is coming back. Yes, he is. Another promise that God says yes to. And it may not seem like it is. Some of you are going through some stuff right now or you see the world in such chaos and you're going, man, it says yes soon. What soon? I understand all that when people say that. But in light of eternity, Jesus will come back like the snap of a finger. In light of eternity. And Jesus will come. And he will bring justice to the injustices. That's a promise of God he says yes to. And that's why the most important yes you can say is your yes back to God. Amen? It's the most important. That's where we start. Our yes back to God. God forgave you. God sent his son, Jesus. God came in the form of a man, Jesus. And he died on a cross for you. And our response to that, I hope your response to that is yes. Yes. Because God said, I'm going to forgive you. Just believe in my son. Believe in Jesus. And that yes to us, that kept of a promise to us, allows us to say yes to God. Yes to salvation. God, I'm excited to say yes to you. That's where I want to start. And then give me the power to say yes to others. But I want to start with this. The ability to say yes. It's one of the unalienable rights that God gives us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.